One of the major diseases of mismatch is obesity. And obesity, as we've seen earlier when we discussed what is a disease, is a disease of homeostasis. Basically, it results from too much food and too little exercise. It also has to do with food quality, with sleep deprivation and the role that ghrelin, a hormone, plays in mediating the effects of sleep deprivation. There are effects of breastfeeding and of C-sections on the risk of obesity. And also having an abnormal weight early in life can change the risk of obesity as an adult. So it's a condition that has many causes. The definition of someone as obese is anyone with a body mass index greater than 30. To put that in context, in 1900, the average body mass, mass index of American men between 40 and 60 was 23. By 2000, it was 27.5. In 2008, more than 15% of U.S. adolescents were obese. Obesity is a major global health issue. Mismatch now is contributing to obesity through energy balance, through food quality, through changes in sleep, changes in our microbiota that result from less breastfeeding and more cesarean deliveries, and under an overnourishment of infants and children. So first, energy balance. Basically, that is the product of too much food and too little exercise. So the image on the left is a, a group of people who were hunter-gatherers in the late 19th century. On the right, there is an office worker in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, that is a shift from an active foraging lifestyle to a sedentary lifestyle. The physical activity level is defined as the total daily energy output divided by the basal metabolic rate. In hunter-gatherers, it's about 1.85. In farmers, it's about 1.78 to 1.86, so farmers can be working just as hard as hunter-gatherers. In office workers, it's about 1.51 to 1.61. What that means is that if a hunter-gatherer or farmer changes to the lifestyle of an office worker while continuing to eat the 3,000 calories a day that he used to need, then he will have an energy surplus of about 450 calories a day. That's enough to make him rapidly obese. If we look at food quality and compare the diets of hunter-gatherers with average Americans and with the U.S. recommended daily allowance, Basically what we see is that hunter-gatherers had less carbohydrate, less sugar, less fat, and less sodium. And that our food quality, compared to hunter-gatherers, has less protein, fiber, vitamin C and D, and potassium. Hunter-gatherers were actually getting a reasonable amount of fat in their diet, but it was less saturated fat they had considerably more fiber in their diet than we do, and they were getting a lot more potassium and a lot less sodium. These are all things that are feeding into mismatched diseases. So if we have a lot of refined starch and sugar in our diet, then we get a spike in blood sugar that results from simple starches that stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin. That causes blood sugar to be taken up by muscle and fat cells. There is now so much sugar and starch in our diet that the spike is unnatural. It stimulates too much insulin and that causes blood sugar then to crash. We then get hungry and we overeat and that will not occur if we were eating complex starches and sugars that were associated with fiber. So refined starches and simple sugars result in an overproduction of insulin, and that causes blood sugar to crash, and that makes us hungry again much sooner than we should be. Another thing that influences our appetite is sleep deprivation and ghrelin. Here are two sleep-deprived men passing out on a park bench. Hunter-gatherers get eight to nine hours of sleep at night, and they take a two-hour nap in the afternoon. So they are actually getting nearly an average of 10 hours of sleep a day. 
Modern Americans sleep six to seven hours at night and only a third of them take naps. So that's a, a sleep deficit of somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four hours per day. Sleep deprivation reduces cell repair, it cuts down immune function, and it increases cortisol, which raises blood sugar. If high levels of cortisol persist, they depress immune function and they increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Sleep deprivation causes the levels of leptin, which inhibits appetite, to fall, and the levels of ghrelin, which stimulates appetite, to rise. Sleep deprived people are therefore hungry and they crave carbohydrates. So our bodies interpret sleep deprivation as a stress that needs to be managed with increased food intake. And it is no longer reliably associated with the kind of stress that needs increased food intake. There are two other important cultural innovations that have gone on. One is that there is less breastfeeding, and the second is that there are more C-sections. One study found that breastfed babies were 13 pounds lighter at 14 years of age than babies that had been f fed formula. Breast milk contains oligosaccharides that stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria in infant guts. So some of this may be mediated by the establishment of a gut flora that can mediate this uptake of energy. A study of 1,255 children in Boston found that birth by C-section doubles the risk of obesity at age three compared to vaginal birth. The intestinal microbiota of infants that are born by C-section resembles that of maternal skin, not that of maternal vagina and anus. Another effect is abnormal weight early in life. As we've seen earlier with our discussion of the Dutch hunger, hunger winter, the nutritional status of fetus in utero and of infants and of young children produces a delayed effect on the risk of adult disease. This is the DOHAD or Developmental Origins of Health and Disease framework. Undernourished infants and children have a greater risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension as adults. That in, this is caused by insulin resistance. This might be a predictive adaptive response that anticipates future food shortage, or it might be designed to protect infant brain during development. We can't really be sure which of those is the correct explanation. Children who are overweight also have increased risk of obesity as adults. So if you're too thin or if you're too heavy as a child, you have increased risk of obesity. The expansion of the visceral fat mass may change appetite and body weight set points and perpetuate over, overeating because persistent high levels of leptin produce leptin resistance and that produces increased appetite and decreased energy expenditure. So to summarize, the causes of obesity are many, the treatments are numerous, people become obese because they eat too much and exercise too little, they eat processed food that produce insulin spikes, they have particular genes, they are sleep deprived and produced more ghrelin, their microbiota have been disturbed by infant formula or by C-section, or they were over or undernourished as children. So it is a multifactorial causal chain, but it is producing one of the major epidemics that currently threaten the health of contemporary populations.